Good morning. When I left off, it was uh, four days ago, December 13th. Today is December 17th, so I've been working on this project for a few days without recording anything. And you can see that me watching Einstein field equations for beginners has grown into a novel. And I have apparently gotten to somewhere around section 4 about curvature, which is only an hour and 12 minutes into the video, but I've filled up a huge amount of text during that period of time. I'd like to try to summarize a little bit by simply asking some vague questions like, what is equation 1? And what is equation 2? Etc. Well, equation 1 tells us the differential change in a scalar field when you go for a differential walk. There are two things being multiplied in equation 1, the uh, gradient and the differential path element. The differential path element consists of a differential distance in the x1 direction and a differential distance in the x2 direction. The gradient consists of a slope in the x1 direction and a slope in the x2 direction. Now these slopes are going to aren't going to work over long distances because presumably these slopes will be different all over the place. So uh, it works only over small distances, a differential path element, for instance. So let's move on to equation 2. Go down here. Here's equation 2. Make that bigger again. And it says what? The form of equation 2 given in the video is shown right here. It is giving us a new form of the gradient because for some reason we don't want to use x1 and x2 to describe our gradient, but rather we want to use y1 and y2 to describe our gradient. Now I'm establishing some of my own conventions here because I absolutely detest Einstein notation. In fact, I distrust Einstein notation. There's a couple of things. Those areas are commutativity and associativity. I think Einstein notation handles commutativity and associativity fairly well if one is careful with the indices. However, I have no knowledge of how to handle the indices. On the other hand, matrix multiplication can handle commutativity and associativity well if you are careful with the ordering of the parentheses, the, the ordering and parentheses. And I do know how have some knowledge of how to handle the ordering in parentheses with matrix multiplication. In any case, when I see multiple representations of the task, then I have greater confidence and, con and understanding of the concept than if I can only see one representation. So what I'm doing here is converting Einstein notation into matrix representation, and I'm also trying out an in-between representation. And while I'm here at equation 2, I'd like to try an example. Uh, we're going to say r theta is y1, y2, and x comma y is x2, sorry, x1, x2. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this um, in-between equation up here as delta phi with the y variables, which are um, r theta going to the right equals, we're going to have del x, which is the x variables, x comma y um, of phi times del x1, our x variables, x comma y um, del y. So del y is r comma theta. This is going to be going across, down, across. Now it's mostly a matter of following those arrows. So this is del phi del r, del phi del theta equals del phi del x, del phi del y times, it's going to be a 4 by 4 matrix, 
del x del r x goes down so del y del r the y goes okay del x del y goes down del r del theta goes across now if we have an example such as x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta then which is pretty typical examples of what x and y would be then we could figure out what this matrix over here is in terms of those variables del x del r would be cosine theta and del x del theta would be negative r sine theta del x del r would be or del y del r would be sine theta and del y del theta would be positive r cosine theta and then everything else can just be copied down and from this we can pull out what we need del phi del r is going to be del phi del x times cosine theta plus del phi del y times sine theta while del phi del theta is del phi del x times negative r sine theta uh, del phi del x uh, plus del phi del y times r cosine theta r cosine theta times del phi del y so now that I've done all that can I imagine a problem that we might need to do that it would be a situation for where for some reason the gradient of Phi were easy to calculate in the XY coordinate system but for some reason it was important to know in a polar coordinate system Hmm. One idea that comes to mind is tidal forces. Let's say I have Io circling around Jupiter. And I want to figure out the tidal forces as a function of Io's coordinate system. And we'll define Io's coordinate system having a radial coordinate being the altitude from the center. And this polar angle being... Um, the direction uh, away from Jupiter along the plane of orbit. So I will call that phi right there. No, I will call it theta because capital phi is our is our um, uh, scalar value. So if I called this big length here r, then phi of uh, I don't want it in terms of r and theta, I want it in terms of x and y. And should I put my zero point of x over here and my, say this is x and this is y, I could put those where, put that zero point wherever I want probably. I think I'd rather put it over here, somehow that uh, feels better. Um, but in any case, um, the uh, tidal effect I think is going to have very very little uh, basis on on the y direction it's almost entirely going to be due to the x direction and the tidal effect is going to be um, I believe it's omega squared r let's make it omega squared capital R Omega squared capital R minus X and then I'm just going to put a plus sign here for now while I figure it out G times the mass of Jupiter over capital R uh, minus X squared 
this will be our fictional uh, centrifugal force, and this would be the actual gravitational force. Now, the only the big problem right here is that this is not a scalar. The uh, tidal effect should have a direction, I believe. Okay, so I've produced an example where we have a vector field that is relatively easy to figure out uh, in the xy coordinate system, but somewhat more difficult to find out in the r theta coordinate system. But my goal was to find a scalar field that was easy to figure out in the xy coordinate system, but somewhat harder to find in the r theta coordinate system. Okay, I'm kind of stumped on that one, but I can come up with a vice versa. The equation for gravitational potential is well known in r theta coordinates, but not so well known in xy coordinates. So let's see if we can work through an example of the use of equation 2. The gravitational potential is well known in the r theta coordinates, but not so well known in the xy coordinates. So I'm going to fix up this notation of Einstein's with my little arrows, del phi del y to the right, del phi del x to the right, del phi del x down, del y to the right. And furthermore, since the easy variables are x and y, and the harder variables are r and theta, we want to go from x equals xy to, to y equals r comma theta. So a further simplification to equation 2, or maybe this is not a simplification so much as a uh, just clarification. So I'm just replacing that y to the nth up there with actually what y1 and y2 are, r and theta and replacing the x to the mth with whatever uh, x1 and x2 are, which is x and y. Let me say that again with the text on the screen. I'm replacing x to the m with whatever x1 and x2 are, that is x and y, and replacing y to the n with whatever y1 and y2 are, e.g. r and theta. Alright, I did that work. I did all this work and uh, now I see I goofed. Actually we want to go from x equals r comma theta to y equals x comma y. But all this work I did is not for naught because I actually handled a good deal of this through little code snippets. For instance, for instance I have this boxed equation up here under the description slash eq2 there we go I'll just grab that and copy it down and I want to replace the xy with r comma slash theta and the r theta with x comma y and see what that looks like See, now it says xy where it said r theta before, and it says r theta where I had xy before. And then the matrix equation, which is right there, is right up there. Copy, paste, and I've got it set up so I can switch out partial right x, y, v with x, y, v, and partial right, this will be r slash theta v, and this one will be r slash theta, um, wait, what did I just do? x, y, r theta, so this will be r theta x, y, r slash theta x and y. Let's see if that compiles. And there it is. Now there's a bad part coming up. It's going to be a lot harder to find the derivatives of r equals square root of x squared plus y squared and theta equals arctangent of y over x than it was to figure out the derivatives of x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. 
Now, the good news is, since the gravitational potential is uh, V of R equals negative GM, negative GM over R, and that has no theta dependence, we really wouldn't even have to calculate the derivatives of the arc, tan of the arc tangent. So I'm going to go ahead and work this out. D del V del X, del V del Y would be equal to Okay, with a couple of well-used macros, it doesn't take too awfully long to fill in the matrices with the relevant formulas. Uh, our undetermined things, partial fraction del V del X, partial fraction del V del Y, and then the uh, aspect over here, I have partial right X, Y, V, where I'm plugging in the X and the Y and the V, uh, the x is, in this case, theta, or is r, no, yeah, r, and then the, the y is theta, and the v is negative gm over r, which is... Okay, with a couple of well-used macros, it doesn't take too awfully long to fill in the ma these matrices with the uh, relevant formulas. Um, we have that del V del X del V del Y, they stay the same, and I've got that here. I should call it slash partial right X, Y, V, and we'll plug in X, Y, and V, and that's all of that begin patri begin p matrix goes away and p matrix goes away and and that should be the same yeah there should be no detectable difference on your screen there i just compiled it and then we have uh partial right x y v but this time we'll plug in r and theta for our x and y and our Instead of V, we're going to put in negative GM over R. And then finally, instead of using for our named variables R, theta, X, and Y, we're actually going to keep the X and Y as they are, but we're going to replace the R with square root of X squared plus Y squared, and the theta with square root of arctangent Y over X, and that goes right there. So. In the end, I'm just going to do the derivatives that I have to do. Um, I'm not good at derivatives, so I'll see if I did this right. Uh, negative gm over r with respect to r should be gm r to the negative 2. Um, the derivative of x squared plus y squared uh, with respect to x is x over x squared plus y squared. And the derivative of square root of x squared plus y squared with respect to y is y over square root of x squared plus y squared. Notice this has a term of r, and these have terms of only x and x squared plus y squared. But replace, I replace this r to the negative 2 with um, 1 over x squared plus y squared. And so that's where this x square root of x squared plus y squared to the cubed comes from on the bottom. Uh, one other thing that this del uh, negative gm over r that is constant in theta, so that is 0, which means there's no need to figure out the derivative of arctangent y over x dx, which is a good thing, especially considering that arctangent of y over x is not even actually correct. This is not um, quite right, because if x is greater than 0, um, if x is less than 0 on this thing, you need to add like pi to this thing. So there should be another function that takes into account that x and y are two separate variables and theta is actually a function of both variables. So if I've done all that correctly, this is the gradient of the gravitational field with respect to x and y, and which is doesn't look so familiar. 
this is the gradient of the gravitational field with respect to r, with respect to the radius, which does look more familiar.